Hi there everyone and welcome back to Higher Biology. Today we are continuing on with the final unit, Unit 3, Sustainability and Interdependence, and we're going on to Kiria 2, which is Plant and Animal Breeding. So this is quite a long video um, as well. There's quite a bit of information in this key area. Some of it we have already touched on in key area one, so that should just be jogging your memory a bit. Um, but when you're going through this, you might not want to watch it all in one go. Uh, you might want to break it up into chunks so you can revise certain parts. So just starting off with this then, we're going to go back to talking about selective breeding and remind ourselves of what that actually means. So, there are breeding programs that are set up in order to improve characteristics of organisms, in order to support sustainable food production. So we talked about sustainable food production in Kiria 1, and we also mentioned selective breeding. We talked about these characteristics, these desirable traits that you want from either livestock or crops. We can set up these breeding programs to ensure that we can pass on these desired characteristics onto offspring. And that benefits uh, food production in a sustainable way. So we mentioned this last time, so maybe a bit of a recap for you, but breeders have been able to develop crops and animals uh, with high yields, higher nutritional values, uh, natural pest and disease resistance, and also the ability to thrive in certain environmental conditions. So say uh, very hot areas, very cold temperatures, areas that have very little rainfall, or a huge amount of rainfall. Now a little recap for you was the desirable characteristics, these traits that you would want your crops and your livestock to have. So for crops, you'd ideally like them to have a higher yield, so that's the how much they produce, what the, how much the product you actually get for them and when you harvest them. You can get higher nutritional values, pest resistance, disease resistance, and that thing that I mentioned a minute ago, that ability to thrive in particular environmental conditions. Uh, so these are all things you'd like your crops to have, and people have went and bred crops in a certain way to try and pass on and build up these characteristics. It's fairly similar with livestock as well. We had a look at the developing size of the chicken and the absolutely terrifying bull. Uh, the characteristics you want your livestock to have, again, is sort of higher yield. You may want an increased body composition, so the ratio of meat to fat, uh, if you're uh, producing enough food or you're selling that off. You also have disease resistance. Litter size can be quite important as well. Ideally, you would want your animal to have uh, quite a lot of offspring that you can pass on. And again, that's environmental tolerance. You don't want to have livestock that would die off with uh, a change in temperature or climate. So what we're going to talk about now that we've covered that is looking at how we go and test this in the field. And we're going to look at plant field trials. So the whole point, the reason for plant field trials is to carry out uh, a range of experiments in different environments in order to compare the performance of either different cultivars, treatments, say fertilizers or GM crops. So you want to compare your new fertilizer or your new cultivar or new genetically modified crop, uh, compare it to other uh, crops to see if it's better, if it's worse, if it doesn't make much of a difference, that side of things. And you can see in this image here how it's all set up. All these plants, uh, all these crops put in different uh, squares. Now we're going to be discussing how we actually run these sort of plant field trials and there's three main things that you have to consider. So if you were to design a field trial, you need to consider, first of all, a selection of treatments. So you can't just have one treatment and just see how it works. Then you don't have a comparison. And that's not how uh, any experiment works, let alone a field trial. Second, you need to take into consideration the number of replicates you use. And we're going to go into a little bit more detail of why that is. And the third one is you need to make sure there's randomization of treatments. And again, we're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail and give you some examples here as well. So first of all, in terms of the selection of treatments, like I mentioned, you have to uh, prove that your new cultivar or fertilizer has actually got a difference compared to different crops. Uh, you can't just grow one crop with a new cultivar or a new fertilizer or genetic modification, and if it grows well, say it's better than everything else. You need to compare them. So the important thing here is that you need that selection of treatments in order to ensure a valid comparison. 
So this is just like any other experiment. You have to make sure there's a valid comparison between whatever cultivar um, treatment or GM crop you're growing compared to other ones. Now, second of all, the number of replicates. Again, just like every other experiment you would do in biology, you need to have a high number of replicates in order to take into account variability within the sample, because you'll have some plants that will just be duds so won't grow as well, or some that actually grow above the average. You need to take into account that variability, but you also need to increase reliability. So the rule of thumb really is that generally the more the better, but just like any other experiment, you want to increase that number of replicates in order to increase the reliability of your plant field trial. And finally, the last one we're going to talk about here is randomization of treatments. Now, you can see here in the image on the right hand side that there's uh, bunches of different colors in these different sections of crops. Now, you can maybe see in the ones in the bottom that there's not really any sort of pattern to these colors. That's because all of these different field trials have to be randomly placed. If you randomly place them, then this eliminates bias when you're measuring the effect. So going back to natural five, if you remember when you used to throw a quadrat to the place. If you had to take into account the number of daisies in the field and use a quadrat, the important thing was that you threw the quadrat randomly to take in a sample of that whole field. If you just walked up to a part that has daisies on it and dropped it down, that is being biased. That is manipulating what the final result is going to be. Now, a better way to actually imagine this is if you imagine this was a field and you had four different cultivars that you were wanting to compare. If you did not randomize the field trial, you can put them into these different plots or into these different rows, and they're all just a totally non-random pattern. Now, think for example, if this was a big field, imagine plot four had the best sunlight. There was always a really optimal level of light uh, that was reaching plot four. However, not as much was reaching C, B, and A. Also, imagine that there's a slight downhill slope on this uh, field, and on plot one, imagine if there was really waterlogged soil. The, the, the soil quality just was not good quality at all. You would have a bias when you took the, the observations of this effect, because you would think that plot four, or trial D, was by far the best, and you would think plot A was probably a bit rubbish. However, that might not be the case at all because you've not taken into consideration things like differing soil conditions, different light intensity. You need to randomize them in order to make sure you do not have a biased observation. So for example, if you had the exact same field trial but you randomize them, then if you always found that D was the better cultivar, then you have a lot more validation to actually say that because it's been put in randomized areas. There's not just one environmental condition that may have had an impact. Okay, so that was the first part of this key area where we looked at your selective breeding and your uh, plant field trials. The next part we're now going to go into is inbreeding. So we're going to have a look at inbreeding, what it does, how it works, and the effects of inbreeding. Once we go past that, we're going to talk a little bit about hybrids that you may have heard of before and uh, go into a bit more detail about fuller breeding with both plants and livestock. So first of all, inbreeding involves the fusion of two gametes from close relatives, and selected related plants or animals can be bred for several generations. Uh, as we've seen before with this selective breeding, you have a trait that you want, so you can uh, pass that on through the genes, until the population breeds true to the desired type, and you also get rid of heterozygotes. So if you're not entirely comfortable with homozygous, heterozygous, dominant genes, recessive genes, and that side of things, I suggest you go to the YouTube channel and you have a look at the uh, variation and inheritance video from National 5, just to brush up your knowledge of them. We're not really going to go into a lot of detail in terms of genetics, but we're going to use the terminology quite a lot, so it's important that you remember uh, what they stand for. So first of all, I mentioned the term true breeding or breeding true there for a second. And I want to talk about what that actually means. So if you have homozygous dominant or homozygous recessive individuals, they are known as true breeding. If you remember homozygous dominant, if we're using a, 
the A for uh, alleles, uh, capital A is dominant, uh, lowercase a is recessive, then homozygous dominant would be capital A, capital A, homozygous recessive would be lowercase a, lowercase a. Now, we would call them true breeding because no matter who you actually uh, breed that organism with, you know which allele they are passing on. If they're homozygous dominant, they can only pass on a dominant A allele, for example. If they're homozygous recessive, they can only pass on a recessive lowercase a allele. If you have a heterozygote though, which is a mix of the two, a dominant and a recessive, you cannot guarantee which allele is going to be passed on. If you don't know which allele is being passed on, you don't know if that trait is going to be getting passed on. So in order for an organism to breed true, they need to be homozygous. This will become very important later on. So in order to go through the process of inbreeding and how this actually works, you would start off with close relatives which have a certain trait that you want and allow them to actually mate. Once they mate, then the offspring they will have generated will have some variation. So there will be some offspring there that have the trait that you want, but there will be other ones there that do not have that trait. What then happens is we refer to them, and it sounds really harsh, but we refer to these animals that do not have the trait you want as inferior animals. We identify them and we separate them from the population and we prevent them from breeding. Conversely, what we do is we take the offspring that do have the desirable characteristics and we allow them to mate through this inbreeding that's going on. Remember, these are all related. Now, the offspring of this generation will also have some variation taking place as well. It's not going to be a quick process, we need to keep going through this. So again, these inferior animals be identified and they are prevented from breeding. Now with this generation, which we we'll refer to as superior animals because they're not the inferior animals that have the traits that we want, they can either be bred with the earlier generation uh, or with parents or with one another. And this basically continues on and on and on, and you always remove the inferior animals which do not have the trait you want. You keep repeating that until the offspring all breed true for the selected trait. So they'll all be homozygous for the trait that you want. They will all display the trait that you want. Now, we're going to move away from talking a little bit about animals to go to plants, and we're going to come back to this in a little bit. But inbreeding can actually naturally occur in some species of self-pollinating plants. Because if you remember from self-pollinating plants, if they pollinate themselves, then they are in fact inbreeding. That's incredibly close genetics. So if you have uh, self-pollinating plants where, for example, their pollen can um, pollinate their own flower, then that is going to be inbred. And a lot of very common uh, plant types, such as peas, wheat, and rice, are all inbred. And we'll come back to how this all works later on. In terms of the effects of inbreeding, you can have a look at this uh, online. There's a lot of different examples, and there's a lot of um, mentions that are made about the, the harmful nature of inbreeding. Now, the reason for that is if you're going through this constant rate of inbreeding, you can build up uh, a lot of harmful mutations. So for example, there's certain tribes that have been very isolated for a long time, and as a consequence, there's been inbreeding that has taken place there. They can have this um, process here, or this condition rather, that's very rare and a harmful mutation, which you wouldn't normally come across, where they have two toes on each feet. Back in National 5, we talked about the blue fugits of Troublesome Creek, uh, the people who had this incredibly rare condition of having blue skin, again through this like homozygous recessive uh, gene which was being passed on through inbreeding. And even uh, to some extent, people now believe historically the Spanish Habsburg kings um, had very distinct uh, elongated chins and jaws and a number of physical complaints, which people believe was due to being inbred at this stage. Now, in terms of the general idea of inbreeding uh, that can be a, a bad thing, we need to actually look at what this can lead to. So inbreeding ensures that members of each generation of this selectively bred strain that we've developed receive alleles for this desired characteristic. So they're all going to display the trait that you want them to display. However, it can also lead to two things. One is a loss of heterozygosity. So 
you're basically getting rid of heterozygotes. They are not going to be there in that family line. And the second is something called inbreeding depression. Now, in terms of loss of heterozygosity, we kind of mentioned this earlier on, but if you go through continuous inbreeding, then you can lose these heterozygotes, so a dominant and recessive in their genotype, and you lead to just homozygotes. And that accumulation of homozygous recessive alleles can be harmful, or a word that we talk about is deleterious. Now, if you have that buildup of deleterious um, mutations or conditions that are going on in these alleles, then that can cause a big effect to your fitness and survival. The big thing here is a decline in something that we call vigour, which is a word we're going to speak about later on. And vigour is your hardiness, your strength, and your stamina. It's just a good indication of your overall uh, strength, fitness, and ability to survive. It can also affect size, can affect fertility, and the yield of whatever crop or livestock you're actually wanting to grow. So this can be a big problem. In order to actually see how this works, there's a diagram here that might look a little bit frightening to start with, but it's just going through each generation of a self-pollinated individual or an inbred individual. So as you can see, imagine there's a, a heterozygous parent that goes through um, a form of self-pollination. Obviously, in this one generation, you can see there's one heterozygote, there's 100% chance of heterozygosity. Now, if you remember from when you did your Punnett squares from National 5, you might be able to figure this one out yourself, but your F1 generation, so your first range of offspring, are going to have a 50% chance of being heterozygous. There's going to be one homozygous dominant, there's going to be two heterozygous, and there's going to be one homozygous uh, recessive. As we go on though through the lines though, and they all reproduce with each other, and the, we look at the chances of genotypes that are being put onto each generation, we find that each time the chances of heterozygosity are decreasing, and eventually we'll just be entirely phased out. So this build-up of homozygosity and this loss of heterozygosity leads to a lot of uh, a difference in genetic variation which you're trying to remove if you want to make sure that each generation is showing this trait. And finally for this part here, we talked about inbreeding depression. So as I said, this buildup of having these homozygous deleterious alleles is going to affect your survival. If it affects your survival, it's also going to affect your likelihood of reproduction. And throughout a population, if you have a buildup of this, a buildup of these uh, recessive deleterious alleles, this is what's known as inbreeding depression, and it can be really bad for your population. Now, earlier on, I mentioned about there being some plants that are naturally self-pollinating. Now, one of the reasons, though, that a lot of plants are actually not susceptible to inbreeding depression, or this ongoing uh, negative impact on the population, is in a lot of self-pollinating plants, natural selection over time eliminates the deleterious alleles. So individuals that are expressing these deleterious alleles uh, will actually just be picked off by natural selection and it will be passing on these genes. So this is the reason why some self-pollinating plants are less susceptible to inbreeding depression when compared to, say, animals. So it's quite an important part to be aware of. Okay, so we've talked about uh, inbreeding, why people uh, choose to use inbreeding, but then the issues that are associated with this. I know there's a lot of different parts being thrown at you, so as I said, maybe don't watch this all uh, in one go. Uh, but for this next part, we're going to talk about crossbreeding, which is very different. So we know that there's problems associated with inbreeding, and we are now looking at new alleles and how they can be introduced into a plant or animal species by this method of crossbreeding. So breeding uh, effectively two different uh, organisms or strains together. So what happens here is that individuals from different breeds can reproduce in order to produce a new crossbreed population with improved characteristics. Now basically what's going to happen here is the two parent breeds can be maintained, they can be used to produce more crossbreed animals, uh, and we're going to see why we do that rather than just using the new crossbred animal itself, which has an improved characteristic. So effectively, a good way of showing this here, um, oh, just one reminder for you when we talk about hybrids, again going back to National 5, if you remember that an individual 
resulting from a cross between two genetically dissimilar uh, parents can produce a hybrid. And a hybrid has both characteristics of the parents. Uh, so in Natural 5, we talked a little bit about things like your uh, lion and tiger being a liger, uh, your zorse, the zebra and the horse, uh, and things like this. These are all kind of weird or wonderful examples, but in terms of hybrids that we actually use uh, in crops and livestock, um, these ones are a bit more straightforward. So imagine if we have parent one here, which is a breed or a variety of plant which has been inbred to the extent that it's true breeding for a high yield. So all the uh, plants of parent one's line are true breeding for high yield. What we can do is we can remove that and we can crossbreed it with parent two, which is true breeding for hardiness. So we have one plant which may not have any other characteristics, may have some deleterious alleles going on, but we know it has the alleles for high yield. And we cross that with a plant that has the alleles for hardiness. If you crossbreed them, you can create an F1 hybrid, which has the best parts of both of those parents. So the F1 offspring is going to have both high yield and also hardiness. So it's basically be a better version of the parent one and parent two combined. The other thing with this crossbreeding or this hybridization of two different inbred homozygous cultivars, uh, this produces offspring that are all heterozygous. So we're moving away from the inbred homozygotes and we end up with F1 hybrids, which are heterozygous. Now you can see an example of this here, obviously in a very basic fashion, and just showing the mix of alleles that are going on. Because remember, if we were going through an inbred line, we've been trying to remove that variation for quite a while. So if we crossbreed two differently inbred lines, we're going to have this heterozygous uh, F1 hybrid. Now, the other reason why this is really good though, is that because there's this mix, we have those poorer recessive genes are now masked by superior dominant genes. So this hybrid, as, much, as well as having the, the best parts of both parents, it's actually going to be a, a better, a fitter organism in its own right. And this is something called hybrid vigor. So hybrid vigor is an increase in both vigor, so we're talking earlier on about vigor, uh, basically your, your, um, your fitness level, you will have an increase in yield and you'll have an increase in fertility. So these are all things that are really important for a plant species. And again, this is a true example on the right hand side on this picture. If you look at parent one and parent two, they were both inbred for certain traits, uh, but there were other recessive genes going on. That F1 hybrid, you can see just from looking at it, it's bigger, it's larger, it's got a higher yield on it in terms of the corn being produced but it'll also have the two traits that parent one and parent two were both bred for. Now, the F1 hybrids, as we've mentioned, are very, very good. They have that hybrid vigor and they have the combined traits of the two parents. However, the F1 hybrids are not usually bred together because the F2 generation would show too much variation from the desired product. Their gene pool is too large now because we've had that combination and we have our heterozygous F1, it means that the F2 generation are going to have way too much variation for us to uh, be sure that we can have whatever characteristic we're looking for. And again, this is an example here in the picture. If you look at the two parents, so C24 is parent one and LER is parent two. If you look at F1, you can see just by looking at it that there's hybrid vigor going on. It's bigger, it's stronger, it's greener, there's more leaf going on and they're all pretty uniform. But if you look at F2, it's very, very mixed. You have some F2 individuals, so the next generation down, which look similar to the F1, but you have some that have barely grown at all, you have some that are a bit of a mix. So there's too much variation, so that is why you do not want to breed the F1 hybrids to create F2 generations. Now, the next part is we're going to talk a little bit more about the genetic side. This is uh, just a little overview. Uh, one thing that we can do in order to try and find uh, what the genetic makeup of an unknown organism is, is perform a test cross. So a test cross is a cross between this organism with an unknown genotype for a trait. So we have no idea what this genotype is for a certain trait, but we can cross it 
with an organism that we know is homozygous recessor for that trait. And the results of their offspring will let us know what that unknown genotype actually is. So again, I've mentioned Punnett squares. Uh, this all looks a bit freaky, but I'm just talking through it. Don't worry about it at all. For example, if you ended up with, uh, up the top here is the known homozygous recessive. Let's say, for example, we have a cross here where uh, T or capital T is the dominant allele for being a tall plant and lowercase t, the recessive allele, is for being a dwarf plant. If you know up the top of all these potential scenarios here, that homozygous recessive is going to be a dwarf plant because they only have little t, little t, homozygous recessive, it will be a dwarf plant. If you cross it uh, with the unknown genotype and you end up with the F1 offspring all being tall, 100% of them are tall, then it must be, or the unknown genotype must be homozygous dominant because that is the only way you could cross with a homozygous recessive and have 100% uh, tall plants. If you found that the F1 generation was 50% tall and 50% dwarf, then we'd be able to go backwards and actually have a look and see the unknown genotype would be heterozygous, so capital T, lowercase t, because that's what leads to that 50-50 split with our homozygous recessive. Finally, if we found that there was actually no effect here and 100% of the F1 offspring were all homozygous recessive, uh, and they were all dwarfs, in terms of their phenotype, and there were none of them that were tall, we would know that the unknown genotype is homozygous recessive. So it's just to give you an overview of what a test cross is and how it works, but it's just a way of finding out what an unknown genotype is by crossing it with a homozygous recessive. Now finally, we're just going to talk a little bit about uh, genetic modification in crops. So we've talked about selective breeding, we've mentioned it a few times now already. This has been going on for a long, long time. Effectively, as long as people had livestock or were um, producing livestock, people looked at selecting different traits. They always wanted either the bigger ones or the, uh, the plants that produced the most uh, yield or the cows that had the most milk, anything like that has been going on. However, now there's now genetic technologies, there's more modern methods which make us uh, speed up the process or it can also improve the accuracy of this breeding. So you're not waiting for generations, uh, you're not leaving up for chance either. So very basically, uh, and this is things we've talked about already in higher, but we're just putting it into this context, we can use DNA sequencing in order to identify a gene for a desirable trait in a plant. So say for example, if there's a, a species of plants that are all very hardy in uh, cold weather, and you really want your crops to have that. Through DNA sequencing, we can identify that gene, we can find that gene, and from recombinant DNA technology, which we talked about at the end of Unit 2, we can remove that gene and we can insert this into our crop genome. Now by doing that, we're going to end up with genetically modified plants with these improved characteristics. So instead of breeding them, instead of going for these um, long processes of, say, inbreeding, we can just take these single genes for the desirable characteristic and we can insert them into the genomes of crop plants. We have these GM plants. And the picture here just shows you a, a naturally occurring uh, breed of a variety of plants on the left hand side and the GM version on the right. And you can see straight away uh, the differences between them. And all it is is that a single gene for whichever characteristic you're looking for here, say it's yield or growth or height or something, has been inserted into these uh, crops to maybe a GM crop. Now finally, uh, just to go through some examples of this so you know how this actually works, uh, maize or corn, uh, that's a crop plant that's been heavily modified in various ways. And one of the main ones we've used is the Bt toxin gene. Now, this gene is responsible for pest resistance. So even going back to National 5, we talked about using um, pesticides and such in crops. One of the ways you could stop using pesticides is through genetic modification. So by inserting this Bt toxin gene into maize, maize crops are now resistant uh, if they have this gene in them from insects. If they're resistant to the attacks on these pests, these insects, then that increases their yield. In a similar way, we have a, a 
glyphosate resistance gene in soya beans. So that's been taken from a different species. It's been inserted into soya bean crops and that gives herbicide tolerance. So what now happens is in order to remove any sort of competition with other plants, other weeds, you can have a field growing soya and you can spray it all with herbicide. Now the herbicide is going to kill off any competing wheat, but it's not going to affect the soya, which has got this uh, new gene added to it. So that means there's going to be no competition and it will increase yield as well, which is a benefit to society. So that's the whole part of different uh, breeding functions, uh, different ways that we're modernising this by adding in recombinant DNA technology. Uh, there's quite a lot in this, uh, in this key area. So well done if you've done this all in one go, but you need to know that plant and animal breeding uh, is used to improve characteristics. Uh, we use that to support our sustainable food production or development of this. We had a look there just at the start about plant field trials and you had to be aware of the selection of treatments, the number of replicates and randomization of treatments and be aware of why you have to do that and apply that to some past paper questions. You'll see it's quite a common thing that comes up. We then took a look at inbreeding, so why you have inbreeding, what the process of inbreeding is, removing those that don't have the, uh, the trait that you want and keeping those that do. Uh, this leads to the elimination of heterozygotes, so it can lead to inbreeding depression because of that buildup of recessive deleterious alleles. And then finally, we took a little look at crossbreeding in F1 hybrids. So why we crossbreed, what we get from it, uh, we looked at the hybrid vigour of F1 hybrids, but also why we don't really want to use the F2 generation because there's too much variation going on. And final, final part was we took a quick look at breeding programmes which involve genetic technology, this more modern version of breeding, which is becoming a much bigger thing uh, in order to feed a growing population. So thank you very much for listening, everyone. Um, I appreciate everyone getting in touch and leaving some comments for, uh, for this or well, previous videos. Uh, hope you're all doing well and you're getting on okay with Unit 3 and I will speak to you later on with Key Area 3 very soon. Thanks so much for listening everyone, take care and see you soon.